Hello class, good day. I am Sir Jenneray, and I will be delivering the first part of the lecture on gene expression. In this lecture, I'll be guiding you through the basic structure of the genetic material and also the basics of DNA replication. The second portion of this lecture will be on transcription and translation, which will be delivered by Sir Patrick. So in this lecture, this will be our general outline of topics or the big ideas. So first, we will discuss the structure of the genetic material. Next, we will discuss the process of DNA replication. So these two uh, topics will be covered in my lecture. And then last, we have the uh, main topic on the flow of genetic information from DNA to RNA. This is actually your transcription process. And then RNA to protein, which is actually the translation process. And for big idea number three, this will be discussed by Sir Patrick. Okay, so let's focus with our first main topic, the structure of the genetic material. First things first, let's just uh, clear out what do we mean by genetic material. In these terms, our operative word here is the word genetic. So when we say something is genetic, we are essentially saying that something is heritable or of or relating to heredity. So a heritable characteristic is a characteristic that can be passed on from one generation to the next generation or from one organism to another organism, especially from parental organism to the offspring. As we mentioned before, living organisms are capable of reproduction either at the cellular or organismal level. But um, regardless of the level, reproduction entails the biological transfer, biological transfer of essential information. from one generation to the next. So let's just qualify this information further. So this information includes biological instruction instruction on the formation and maintenance of one whole organism or species. So for this information to be passed on, it should somehow be stored somewhere or to something. And this something would be the genetic material. So in living systems, the genetic material must be one of the biomolecules or of the building blocks of life. So we have amino acid, nucleotides, um, lipids, carbohydrates. But as to what specific molecule constitutes the genetic material was a mystery back then until there are a series of experiments conducted by several scientists that progressively worked on a quote and unquote transforming molecule. That can be passed on from one generation or one organism to the next. Okay, so 
one of the first pivotal experiments in relation to the discovery and the characterization of the genetic material is the Griffiths experiment. So um, in 1928, Frederick Griffith, who is a British bacteriologist, conducted experiments involving Streptococcus pneumoniae bacteria in mice. Okay, so Streptococcus pneumoniae in mice. In actuality, Griffith wasn't trying to identify the genetic material, but rather he's actually trying to develop a vaccine against pneumonia. But um, anyways, in his experiments, uh, Griffith used two related strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae, the S strain and the R strain. So let's just quickly um, contrast the two. So first you have the S strain. So the S strain of Streptococcus pneumoniae forms colonies that were rounded and smooth. Hence the abbreviation S. Okay, so the smooth appearance was due to a polysaccharide coat produced by the bacteria. And this coat would protect your um, S strain from the immune system of the mouse. And because of this, the mouse can't eliminate the bacteria and thus the S strain is capable of causing a disease. So mice injected with live S strain would develop pneumonia and would die. So that's um, illustrated here in this portion of the figure. So you have here a live S strain injected to a mouse, the mouse would develop pneumonia and would eventually die. So in essence, your S strain is virulent. It causes a disease. In addition, there are also living uh, S strain cells that would be found in the heart or in the blood samples. Okay, so um, your S strain is uh, uh, smooth no, due to the polysaccharide coat and is virulent. On the other hand, you have the R strain. So the R strain would be the strain of Streptococcus pneumoniae that would form colonies with well-defined edges and rough appearance, hence the abbreviation R. In contrast to your uh, smooth or your S strain, your R strain is non-virulent. Non-virulent. So that would mean that when they are injected to a mouse, they will not cause a sickness. So that's um, demonstrated in, uh, let me just clear first the annotations, some of the annotations. Okay, so that's demonstrated in this portion of the image or of the illustration. So you have living R strain, which is non-virulent, even if it's living in, so it's metabolically active since it's non-virulent, if it's injected to the mouse, it will not cause any disease, disease or sickness. So the mouse lives. Okay, so um, as part of his experiments, uh, Griffith tried injected mice with a heat killed S bacteria. So basically you would have um, metabolically inactive or dead uh, S strain. In that uh, dead S strain was injected to a mouse. And of course, as expected, no pneumonia developed because the causative agent, which is the S strain, is killed. So even uh, so, if you injected the S strain, the hit killed S strain to the mouse, the mouse will still live. 
So uh, that that is uh, demonstrated in this portion of the uh, image. Okay, so it's unsurprising that the heat killed S bacteria did not cause disease in the mouse. Okay, so however, in one of his um, setups, there's an unexpected turn of events. So when harmless R bacteria, when harmless R bacteria were combined with heat killed, with heat killed S bacteria. So this, they're both supposed to be harmless. No? So when the uh, R bacteria were combined with now harmless heat killed S bacteria and were injected into a mouse, the mouse developed pneumonia and died. And more surprisingly, uh, Griffith found that the blood samples from the mouse contained living S bacteria. So he was really baffled by the results and can't fully explain what happened, but he was able to conclude that there must be a chemical substance that is capable of genetically transforming the R strain to an S strain. Okay, so Griffith concluded that the R strain bacteria must have taken up what he called back then a transforming factor from the heat killed S bacteria, which allowed them to transform into the smooth coated bacteria and become virulent. Okay, so Griffith demonstrated that a transforming factor can be passed on from one cell to another. However, the chemical identity of that molecule of that transforming factor is still unknown. In, the, in an experiment by Avery McLeod and McCarthy in 1944, they suggested that DNA is the transforming factor, that DNA is the genetic material. So um, their experiment uh, basically was um, a progressive purification of the transforming factor identified by Griffith. So uh, what they did was they uh, uh, purified the transforming factor. They separated it out from other cellular components by the use of enzyme. So in their experiment, they also used uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, the S strain, and the S strain, sorry, and the R strain. So same setup. They would have a heat killed S strain, and later on they would add the live R strain, and then see if in their final setup, if the R strain are successfully transformed. However, they added this step the addition of enzymes that would destroy cellular component. Yeah. So um, if the chemical that has been added or if the enzyme that has been added has destroyed a particular biomolecule and uh, upon destruction of that biomolecule and no transformation has occurred, then that eliminated molecule must be the transforming factor. So from their experiments, they observed that, uh, let's just zoom in to, to DNA. So they have observed that when they added DNAs or an enzyme that would destroy DNA, there is no transformation that happened. So meaning the elimination of DNA led to non-transformation. So it's the DNA that causes the transformation. So transforming factor... is indeed DNA. Uh, in addition, they also tried to prove this through stoichiometric means. 
So they have observed that stoichiometrically speaking, the transforming factor closely resembled DNA in its ratio of nitrogen and phosphorus, ratio of atoms of nitrogen and phosphorus, thus reinforcing that uh, the transforming factor is really DNA. Okay, so another experiment that appointed to DNA as the genetic material is the experiment by Hershey and Chase in 1952. Okay, so in their experiment, they used a bacteriophage or they used bacteriophages in their experiments. So bacteriophage basically is a virus that would attack bacterial cells. Okay, attacks bacterial cells. So uh, these phages would attach to the surface of a host bacterial cell and would inject some substance in, into the host. Uh, that substance is either DNA or protein, either DNA or protein only. So this uh, injected substance would give instructions to the host bacterium to start making lots and lots of phages. So in other words, Whatever it was that the phage is injecting into the bacterial cell was the phage's genetic material. So to establish whether the phage injected DNA or protein into the host bacteria, Hershey and Chase prepared two different batches of phage, as you can of phages, as you can see in this illustration. So they have two batches. In each batch, the phage were produced in the presence of a specific radioactive element, which will then be incorporated into the macromolecules that uh, made up the phage. So in setup number one here, in setup number one, they uh, have cultured the phage with uh, P32, P32. So um, P32 is a radioactive isotope of phosphorus. And this uh, attaches to the DNA component, the DNA only, okay? So the next batch of uh, phage would be uh, cultured in a medium with S35. Your S35 is a radioactive isotope of sulfur. And this radioactive uh, isotope of sulfur would attach or would label the protein component only of your um bacteriophage okay so as you can see here in this this uh stage or this portion of um the experiment yeah each batch of uh, phage was used to infect a different culture of bacteria so the bacteria here would be this same in this batch and so after infection had taken place each culture were uh, then homogenized in a blender, and then the cultures were centrifuged to separate the bacteria from the phage debris. So after infection, the culture was then homogenized. So it, homogenization would be uh, described in this uh, portion already. Okay, so infection and then uh, homogenization in a blender. So the cultures were uh, centrifuged to separate the bacteria from the phage uh, debris. So just a background there, no? pag sinabi natin centrifugation, it's, it's a process where your um, sample would be spun around at uh, high uh, speeds. No? So revolutions per minute. Ma mataas yung yung uh, speed ng pag revolve centrifugation you can actually separate your um, solution or the contents of your solution based on density or based on how heavy the components uh, were so in this case uh, your solution is made up of um, of course you have bacteriophage and uh, bacterial cells your bacter bacterial cells are relatively heavier than the bacteriophage components. So when you subject your sample into centrifugation, you would expect that 
at the bottom of the, the centrifuge tube, or uh, you will find a pellet uh, that which would be composed of the heavier components of the sample. So in essence, what you will find at the bottom of the centrifuge tube would be bacterial components. And what you will find on the upper portion of the um, centrifuge tube in the supernatant would be the bacteriophage components. So when uh, Hershey and Chase measured radioactivity in the pellet and supernatant from both of their experiments, they found that a large amount of P32 appeared in the pellet, whereas almost all of the S35 appeared in the supernatant. So based on these experiments, Hershey and Chase concluded that DNA and not protein was injected into the host cells and made up the genetic material of the phage. So all in all, the result of their experiments would point to DNA as the genetic material. Okay. So um, several experiments after that of Hershey and Chase have characterized and identified the composition of DNA. So it was discovered that DNA would be a polymer of nucleotides, each consisting of nitrogenous base, sugar, and phosphate. We will um, discuss this in more detail in the next slides. For now, let's just say that um, it was discovered or it was known that DNA is composed of these uh, these components. And so, however, even if the composition of DNA was already characterized, it still wasn't clear how the DNA encode the genetic information. So additional research by many scientists led to the discovery of the DNA structure, clarifying how DNA can actually encode large amounts of uh, information. And one of those scientists is Erwin Sharga. And so in uh, 1950, and uh, we're just reporting the ano ha, um, relevant na findings. So in 1950, Erwin Sharga reported that DNA composition varies from one species to the next. It's also uh, Shergaff who discovered that DNA is responsible for heredity. And then um, another important finding or observation by Erwin Shergaff is that the amount of purine or the adenos, adenine sorry, and guanine bases is equal to pyrimidine Basis. Pyrimidine, you have the thymine and cytosine. So um, basically what he observed was this. Um, the total amounts of purine bases is equal to the amount of pyrimidine bases. More specifically, he observed that the amount of adenine is equal to the amount of thymine. So as you can see here in the table, so um, in E. coli, uh, there's this amount of adenine in the DNA, 24.7% of the DNA is adenine. And then for thymine, it's 23.6. It's almost equal, magkalapet yung kanilang values. And uh, for guanine, the amount of guanine was equal to that of cytosine. So for E. coli, again, it's 26%. For cytosine, it's 25.7. And he saw that across species, this observation remains true. So let's um, look at a plant system, at the, at the wheat. So for the wheat, the adenine is 28.1. The thymine is 27.4 almost equal then and uh, also for the guanine and the cytosine in the cross species that he uh, that uh, he examined it remains true that the amount of adenine is equal to that of thymine 
and the amount of guanine is equal to the amount of cytosine. Okay, so uh, two of these findings uh, became known as Chargaff's rules. So one, and the base composition of DNA varies between species. However, and in any species that uh, in any species, the number of A and P bases are equal, and the number of G and C bases are equal. So this is just an observation during Chargaff's rule. However, the or during Chargaff's time, sorry. Um, however, the basis for these observations was not understood until the discovery of the double helix. Okay, so uh, findings of Chargaff and other scientists provided pieces of information about the DNA as the genetic material. And these observations all made sense and were all unified by the findings of Watson and Crick. So all of these findings by um, uh, scientists led to the deduction of the secondary structure of the DNA. So it's not just um, the work purely the work of Watson and Crick that led to the discovery of the double helical structure of the DNA. It was actually with the help of the findings of uh, other scientists. So namely, you have the observation of Sergaff, the X-ray crystallography data of Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkins, and construction of 3D structures by Linus Pauling. Okay, so we just want to emphasize, emphasize that even though uh, it's uh, Watson and Crick who um, had the credit you know, of of the of discovering the double helical nature of the DNA molecule, it's actually it's actually a product of um, findings, results of experiments of several scientists. It's just that Watson and Crick uh, unified all of these findings. and deduced that the secondary structure of the DNA was a double helical structure. Okay, so as I've mentioned from the previous slide, and Watson and Crick reported that DNA consisted of two polynucleotide strands wrapped into a double helix. So in addition to, to the... Uh, the main finding that DNA is a double helical structure, they also reported these findings. So um, the, the sugar phosphate backbone is on the outside. The strands are anti-parallel. So that would mean the two strands, the two polynucleotide strands would uh, run at opposite directions. So one strand would run from five prime to three prime end. And then the other strand would be from three prime to five prime end. So um, another important finding is that uh, the, ni the nitrogenous spaces are perpendicular to the backbone in the interior. And the next, um, they also reported that specific pairs of bases give the helix a uniform shape. So this is where the observation of Sargaff would come into play. And so um, they reported that A pairs with P and G pairs with C. And because of this pairing, you can expect that the amount of adenine in a DNA molecule would always be equal 
to that of thymine because exactly because of this because your a would pair with d and uh, the amount of guanine in your dna molecule would equal the amount of cytosine because of this because your g pairs with c in addition to to this uh discovery of the complementary base pairing they also reported that the pairing between a and t forms two hydrogen bonds and the pairing between g and c forms three hydrogen bonds okay so um, the discovery of uh, the secondary structure of dna is important because it explains a lot about the observations and behavior of the DNA molecule. So again, let's take uh, Sergaff's uh, rule as an example. And so Sergaff observed that the amount of thymine is always equal to adenine and cytosine to guanine. Another way of looking at it is that the number of purine bases, so adenine and guanine, uh, again, I'll just put it here again, purine, yeah, bases, the amount of uh, purine bases would equal the number of py pyrimidine bases, which is thymine and cytosine. And so as interpreted by Watson and Crick, uh, this also fits the description of the DNA, structurally speaking. So remember that they uh, also reported that the DNA is uniformly helical. And that is only achieved if the base pairing occurs between purine and pyrimidine. So as you can see here in this uh, figure, if the uh, pairing is between purine and purine, it would be too wide. If the pairing is between pyrimidine and pyrimidine, the uh, width of the uh, DNA molecule would be too narrow. However, as they have obser observed, your DNA molecule is uniform uniformly helical, and uh, that is only achieved if the pairing is always between purine and pyrimidine, which is supported by Chargaff's rule. Okay, so just to help us imagine the helical structure of the DNA, let's uh, look at this figure. So this uh, rope ladder model of the double helix. So the margin of the rope ladder would be your sugar phosphate backbone, and the rungs of the ladder would be the paired nitrogenous basis and if you try to twist a rope ladder it would assume a heli double helical structure okay so in this slide we're just uh, showing you uh, different representations of the dna basically all of this uh, would reflect the double helical structure or double helical nature of the dna molecule so we have the rib one model showing you the, this would be the sugar phosphate backbone. This would be the nitrogenous bases that pair up. We also have a partial chemical structure model. So it would show you still, this would be the sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, so this would be the phosphate group. This is your sugar uh, ribose five carbon uh, sugar is a ribose. And then you have the nitrogenous bases that uh, pair up. So as we mentioned before, uh, your GC pairing would have three hydrogen bonds and your AT pairing would have two hydrogen bonds. We also have here a computer model of the DNA. Okay, so now let's focus on the components of 
pDNA and RNA. E, let's include RNA also. The, in terms of uh, composition, the main difference between DNA and RNA is in their sugar phosphate backbone, mainly the uh, sugar portion. For DNA, the sugar component is deoxyribose. And for RNA, the sugar component is ribose. Another difference is in the bases that they would have. In RNA, instead of thymine, you have uracil. Okay. Anyways, now let's focus on the components of DNA and RNA. So your nucleic acids, no, mainly the D DNA and RNA, are actually polymers of nucleotides. So meaning, or another way of putting it, is that the building block of DNA and RNA is a nucleotide. Okay, so the monomer of DNA and RNA is a nucleotide. The monomer of nucleic acid is a nucleotide. The basic building block of nucleic acid is a nucleotide. Okay? Okay. Now, a nucleotide is composed of three major components. You have the nitrogenous base, ATGC, a five carbon sugar, the ribose, or deoxyribose, okay, so I'll just put it in ATGC, and a phosphate group. Okay, so all of these, these uh, figures are telling the same thing. It's just that um, going to the right, there's an increasing molecular detail of the components of your DNA. Okay, so here you have the, this is the sugar phosphate backbone. This would be the nitrogenous base, which would pair with another strand. Okay, so when we uh, zoom in and add more molecular detail to this structure, it should look like this. Okay, so you have your sugar phosphate backbone. This would be your phosphate. This would be your uh, five carbon sugar. And then this will be your nitrogenous base. Okay, so zooming in further and adding more molecular detail. So in here, let's zoom in on this portion. It would look like this. Okay, so this will be the molecular structure for the, sorry. Uh, yeah, chemical uh, molecular structure of thymine, of the sugar and the phosphate. Okay, so in this stage, I just want to emphasize, I just want to emphasize uh, this. In the sugar, uh, for the sugar component of your DNA, as we've mentioned before, it's five carbon sugar. So you're expected to see five carbon molecules, five Cs there. So you have here carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five. Okay. Okay. So when a DNA molecule or when DNA, uh, when DNA is synthesized, you can only add at this portion of the molecule, at the carbon three or at the three prime. So yes, the basis for the directionality of the DNA, so remember, you usually um, indicate the directionality of of the DNA, either as five prime to three prime or three prime to five prime, the basis for, for these numbers would be this. Then the position of the carbon, of the uh, sugar component, 
of your nitrogenous base. Okay, so in this case, if if uh, this is carbon five and this is carbon three, you expect that um, the direction would be this is the five prime end and this is the three prime end. And you can only add, let me just clear, you can only add new um, nucleotides in this region. That's why later on in the uh, portion of DNA replication, it will always be emphasized that you can only add nucleotide at the three prime end. It's, it's because of this. So molecularly speaking or chemically speaking, this the three prime end would be the only uh, region where you can add another um, molecule, another nucleotide. Okay, so um, in this uh, slide, we're just showing you the uh, molecular structure of your nitrogenous bases. And so again, you have uh, pyrimidines, you have the thymine and cytosine. So just a mnemonic, pyrimidines would be those with letter pyrimidines, Y. Thy thymine and cytosine also have this Y. Okay, so I hope this would help you remember the pyrimidines. Pyrimidines, thymine, and cytosine. Next, purines, you have, of course, the remaining nitrogenous uh, bases. You have adenine and guanine. Okay, so another um, uh, thing, another difference that you can see here between uh, purine and pyrimidine is that your uh, pyrimidine would be a heterocyclic aromatic compound with just one ring in contrast to purines, no? which would have two rings, one, two, one, two. So in this slide, we're just showing you the uh, base pairing in DNA. So we've established this before. Your adenine always bonds to thymine, forming two uh, hydrogen bonds. And then guanine always pairs up with cytosine, forming three hydrogen bonds. Okay, so in, uh, in terms of base pairing, maybe a mnemonic that I can give you is that the curvy letters, uh, G and C, would uh, pair up. And then the pointy letters, A and P, would pair up. Okay, so uh, just a sidebar. Um, I just want to emphasize this. No? So in 1962, the Nobel Prize was awarded to James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins for the discovery of the uh, helical structure of the DNA. However, um, Watson and Crick wouldn't be able to deduce the secondary structure of the DNA if not for the uh, X-ray crystallography data or picture by Rosalind Franklin. So uh, it is said that Rosalind Franklin probably would have received the prize as well but she died before the Nobel Prize was awarded. So Nobel Prizes are never awarded posthumously. And then um, next, just a sidebar. So Watson and Crick, they're very um, prominent in the scientific community because of their discovery. However, there's this issue, especially with uh, James uh, Watson, yeah, so a, this is a clip from a news from the New York Times. Yeah, so a lab severs ties with James Watson, citing unsubstantiated and reckless remarks. This is in line with the statement of Dr. Uh, James Watson uh, that uh, basically he said that there's an IQ difference between blacks and whites. Uh, and that reflects underlying genetic differences shaped by natural selection. So basically what he's trying to say is that there's a genetic basis for the difference in the IQ levels of blacks and whites. However, that was unfounded and racially motivated. 
And that's an irresponsible thing to do, especially if you're someone prominent. You know? Imagine the influence that you have in the scientific community and you would have this racially motivated, unsubstantiated and reckless remarks towards a particular group of people saying they're inferior compared to your race. Okay, so now let's go to the next um, main topic of this lecture, the DNA replication. Okay, so now uh, we have a uh, grasp of the general structure of the genetic material, which is the DNA. Now, uh, as we've mentioned before, uh, in the genetic material, information is stored, and now we know that it's stored in a DNA and in the form of uh, nitrogenous base sequences. Now, um, it's not just simply stored, it's also replicated so that you have copies that can be uh, passed on to the next generation or to other cells or to another organism. And that's what we will discuss in this uh, section. Okay, so DNA replication depends on specific base pairing. In the description made by Watson and Crick now in relation to the DNA molecule, they uh, uh, have suggested that DNA would have a possible copying mechanism. And also uh, Watson and Crick said that uh, this copying mechanism would also be founded on specific base pairing. Also from uh, the previous slides we have emphasized that this specific base pairing would be that pairing between um, adenine and thymine, then guanine with cytosine. Okay, so uh, DNA replication follows what we call a semi conservative model. So when a DNA replicates, when a DNA molecule replicates, first the uh, DNA strand, remember your DNA molecule is composed of two strands running an, in an anti-parallel fashion. So before, uh, before the replication process, these two strands need to separate. And each strand would be used as a pattern or template to produce a complementary strand through complementary base pairing. So each new DNA helix that will be formed would have one old strand and one new strand. That's why it's called semi conservative model because the new DNA molecules that would be produced would be composed of an one old strand and one new strand. So um, that will be illustrated better in, in uh, the following slides. Okay, so let's say here we have a parental molecule of DNA. So this would be the original DNA that will um, undergo replication for uh, first so you have here two strands right one strand another strand so first it will separate so uh, original strand also the original strand so they will separate and then uh, the uh, the dna will be replicated through complementary base pairing so you just have uh, free nucleotides that would attach to the uh, template strand. So uh, this will just have undergo complementary base pairing, forming now two identical daughter molecules of DNA. But as you can see, the new molecules are composed of, or each um, daughter molecules are composed of one original strand and one uh, newly synthesized strand. That's why it's semi-conservative. 
Okay, so this image would show you the same thing. It also shows you that uh, the uh, DNA replication follows the semi-conservative model. So this is your original strand or parent DNA molecule in Zen. Um, in the synthesis of the daughter molecules, in the synthesis of the daughter molecules, um, one would be the original strand, the other would be a newly synthesized strand. So basically the same as the uh, image or the concept shown in the previous slide, but in here you're incorporated, incor we're incorporating the untwisting of the DNA, or at least here we're showing the uh, double helical conformation of the DNA. Okay, so on a closer look of uh, DNA replication, so just uh, some details about DNA replication. Okay, one, the copying of DNA is remarkable in its speed and accuracy. So it's very rare that there are copying errors in the DNA. Given the number, the sheer number of base pairing that, uh, that uh, would undergo in the DNA replication, the uh, copying error is really, really low. Plus, in addition to the high fidelity, speed and accuracy of DNA replication, uh, your cell would also have repair mechanisms. However, there will be instances that copying errors still occur, and uh, sometimes those copying errors would result to mutations. But all in all, or generally speaking, uh, DNA replication is an accurate process. Okay, so next detail about the DNA replication is that more than a dozen enzymes and other proteins participate in DNA replication. So later on, we will just enumerate some of the important enzymes and proteins that participate in uh, DNA replication. Okay, so getting started with uh, DNA replication. So first, your uh, DNA replication would start at locations called origins of replication. So what happens here is that first your DNA would unwind. Remember, it's a uh, double helical structure with uh, supercoiling. In the for replication to occur, of course, you need to unwind, untwist the DNA and create an opening or a bubble in which the replication process would begin. So at the end of each replication bubble is what we call a replication fork. So later on, we will have um, images that would show you uh, how an origin of replication would look like. Okay, so a eukaryotic chromosome may have hundreds or even thousands of origins of replication. Remember that eukaryotic chromosomes, eukaryotes in general, would have longer gene sequences and would have larger chromosomes. In the thus, it uh, they would have longer stretches of DNA. So for the replication process to so to uh, facilitate the replication process to uh, hasten in a way there would be several origins of replication. In addition, replication would proceed in both directions from each origin until the entire molecule or until the entire stretch of DNA is copied. Okay, so um, this is just the contrast with a prokaryote. So we have here a model organism, model prokaryote organism, we have an E. coli. So for prokaryotes, usually they would have shorter uh, gene sequences and their, their genetic material usually assumes a circular, not all of them, but um, usually they would have a circular uh, DNA. So uh, for them, it's, it's quite simple and the, their replication process would be faster. So in any case, let's just use this um, as our 
uh, model, model organism. So we have here a circular double-stranded DNA molecule, as we mentioned before, for the replication to start, you should have an opening, a bubble, and that would be your origin of replication. So in the origin of replication, your um, parental DNA molecule would separate, creating this bubble. So in this origin of replication, the uh, replication process would proceed in both directions, proceed in both directions. And here, the areas in, so uh, this area and this area are what we call the replication fork. And then eventually, so eventually, after the replication process, you would produce two daughter DNA molecules. So in this figure, in this figure, it's, it's an electron micrograph of um, a circular DNA of E. coli undergoing replication. So this is your origin of replication. This would be the bubble. And this would be your replication fork. This is another replication fork. Okay, so to help us visualize, I have here a uh, GIF. So here the solid uh, lines, both the blue and the red, would be the uh, parent DNA molecule. The dotted uh, lines there would be the newly synthesized DNA molecule. So after replication, well, replication, so you expect copying, you have another copy. And so after replication, you will have doubled the genetic material. Okay, so in eukaryotes, usually we have a linear DNA and we have longer gene sequences. So it would, uh, replication of our DNA would take longer time. But to speed up the process, one of the adaptations or mechanisms of our cells would be to have multiple uh, origins of replication, not just one. So imagine if you only have one um, bubble, it will take longer time as opposed to having multiple bubbles, multiple replication forks. Okay, so still in relation to that, DNA replication proceeds in two directions at many sites simultaneously, okay? So in the uh, replication proper, the first your DNA strands should be uh, prepared and uh, that is the preparation of the DNA strand is facilitated by these enzymes. Remember that your DNA molecule is, as I mentioned before, um, is a helical structure and would have super coiling. And for replication to occur, first you need to unwind and untwist the DNA so that you can pry it open, expose the template strand, and let the other enzymes do the actual synthesis of the new DNA strand. So in uh, preparing the DNA strand, these would be some of the enzymes that are important to uh, no. So first we have the helicases. Uh, helicases would be the enzymes that untwist the double helix at the replication forks. Next important um, protein would be the SSB proteins or the single strand binding proteins. So as uh, their function would be to uh, bind to the DNA molecule or strand and, stab uh, and stabilize it. So um, the main function of the SSB proteins would be to hold your DNA in place or make it stable while the replication process is um, ongoing. Because in the absence of SSB proteins, even if you have unzipped the DNA, 
it will it's it will naturally uh, bind again. So to keep it open, you need SSB proteins. Next, you also have topoisomerases, which would correct, which sorry, which would correct overwinding ahead of replication forks by breaking, swiveling, and rejoining DNA strands. As you can, so uh, these enzymes are seen in this illustration. So you have here the helicase that would unwind your DNA. You have here the SSB proteins that would hold your uh, single strand, this just this strand, that's why single strand in place. And then you also have this tobo isomerase that would prevent the overwinding or supercoiling of your uh, DNA molecule. Okay, so uh, next for the synthesis, actual synthesis of a new uh, DNA strand, these would be the enzymes that are uh, important. First, we have the primase. So uh, primase is an enzyme that's involved in the synthesis of the RNA primer. So your primase can start an RNA chain from scratch and would add RNA nucleotides one at a time. So apparently, um, in the synthesis of new strand, new DNA strand, it does the DNA molecule would need an RNA primer first. So meaning um, the actual uh, synthesis of DNA can't be done directly. First, you need to have an RNA primer. And from that RNA primer, your DNA polymerase would um, detect that RNA primer or would recognize that RNA primer and start the elongation or the actual synthesis of new DNA strand. Okay, so uh, DNA polymerase. And I have mentioned about the DNA polymerase. That's just... Um, Continue the discussion. So DNA polymerase would catalyze the elongation of a new DNA at the replication fork. As I've mentioned before in the first portion of the lecture, um, your DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to the three prime end. And each nucleotide that is added to a growing DNA strand is a nucleoside triphosphate. So you have these uh, free nucleosides that would attach to the growing DNA strand. Okay, so this figure would show you the uh, synthesis of a new DNA strand. So this would be our template strand. This is the new strand being synthesized. So you have, this would be the growing chain. Okay, so in this portion, in this portion, this would be uh, an area where a new nucleoside would be added. So your nucleoside would be your nucleoside would be composed of a sugar of three phosphate groups and one nitrogenous base. So this should uh, pair with this. So still we're operating uh, with the complementary base pairing. So T to A, G to C. So this, the, this binding of nucleoside triphosphate to the growing strand is facilitated or catalyzed by DNA polymerase. And in this process, two uh, phosphate groups will be removed. So you will discuss more of this in your cell biology and in your biochemistry. For now, what's important to know is that you can only add at the three prime end of your growing uh, DNA strand. Okay, so still in the synthesis of a uh, new DNA molecule. Okay, so as we mentioned before, you can the DNA polymerase can only add can only add um, 
eunucleoside triphosphates at the three prime end. And that would have consequences in the actual in the synthesis of new strands depending on the direction of your template strand. So um, let's just look at this figure. So you have here the parental DNA. Of course, it's composed of two strands, one running from five prime to three prime N, the other, of course, antiparallel, the other three prime to five prime N. So of course, this uh, uh, DNA strand should be opened or unzipped. So if, if you unzip, this DNA molecule, it should look like this. So this would be a replication fork. The synthesis of, of DNA in this, in sorry, in this strand should not be a problem because um, your DNA polymerase can continuously synthesize new molecule because its direction would be five prime to three prime. So five, five prime here, three prime here, you can just continuously add new nucleoside triphosphates. So in, in this strand, there's a continuous synthesis. However, that is not the case in this strand. In this strand, DNA synthesis is discontinuous. Because of the directionality of the template strand here, or of the parent strand here, the direction of synthesis can only be from this portion to that portion. So the consequence is that um, the synthesis would be discontinuous because um, it needs to wait for the helicase to unwind again a certain portion of the DNA before it can start another uh, synthesis or before it can elongate the uh, newly synthesized DNA molecule. In this uh, strand, it's not a problem because the direction of synthesis is the same as direction of the unwinding. Okay? So in this strand, as we've mentioned before, the synthesis is discontinuous, leading to the formation of uh, short sequences of DNA nucleotides, fragments of uh, DNA nucleotides, uh, sorry, uh, fragments of the, the newly synthesized DNA strands. And they are um, also known as the Okazaki fragments. Okay, so with this uh, this continuous uh, synthesis of the DNA molecule, it is expected that there will be gaps. There will be gaps in the DNA molecule. And of course, uh, that can't remain that way. So your uh, cell would have its, its mechanism, would have another enzyme that would solve that problem. And that is your DNA ligase. And so your ligase is involved in repairing irregularities or breaks in the backbone of the double-stranded DNA molecules. So it, it seals the, DNA, uh, the NICs in the DNA. So in essence, it's repairing the DNA. Yeah. It seals recombination fragments and it connects Okazaki fragments. So to have a better grasp of the whole process, um, watch the video found in this link.